On this episode, we talk to David Robinson, director of Bangkok River Partners and co-founder of the Creative District Foundation. So if you want to learn more about the Chao Phraya River and the movement to maintain its unique charm, you'll dig this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawadee crap. This is my voice in your ears coming to you from the Bangkok podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001, but never heard the song One Night in Bangkok until like 2010. True story. Is that true? Yeah, I never heard it. Never even knew it existed. Oh my God. I'm not sure I'd be so open about that. (laughs) And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 20 years ago, fell in love with eating the same food every meal of the day. So I stayed. I mean, like rice and stuff? Just, I feel like Thai people, they don't really eat different f- food at each meal. You know what I'm saying? Are you with me? It's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all around the rice and the noodles. So, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. We want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons, Jonathan Gadir, who supports us at the show shout out level. Stick around after we're done talking with David Robinson about his organization's efforts to promote the mighty Chow Praia River community to hear why with Jonathan in our corner. We can say pretty much anything we want on the podcast without fear of repercussions. Yeah, baby. And a huge thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our ad-free regular show a day early, behind-the-scenes photos and videos of our interviews, discounts on swag, which you can find on our website, and various other things that aren't available to regular listeners. But best of all, patrons like Jonathan also get an unscripted uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and random topics we just finished recording this week's bonus show and we chatted about greg's increasingly frequent inability to understand new technology trends and if that means he's an old man spoiler alert probably (laughs) and my experience buying cbd oil from a very suspicious but hopefully legal store (laughs) as well as a really great video on buying THC products in Thailand made by former guest and friend of the show, Pailin Wedel, which you can check out in our show notes. To become a patron, head to bangkokpodcast.com forward slash support. All right. Well, on this episode, we are going to dive into one of our favorite parts of Bangkok, and that is the area around the mighty Chao Phraya River. And to do so, we brought on a specialist, a young fellow by the name of Mr. David Robinson, who is a director of Bangkok River Partners and co-founder of the Creative District Foundation. These organizations are most visible on his website, BangkokRiver.com, which serves to promote the Chao Phraya River and research and write about the riverside communities to inform residents and visitors alike of what's on and what is around. It's a really great website, and it's a treasure trove of historical, cultural, and local information that has the support of pretty much everyone who knows all about the amazing nooks and crannies that make up life along the river and want to keep its unique aura going well into the future for everyone to enjoy. So here is my interview with Mr. David Robinson. All right. Well, uh, we are here with, uh, I'd like to say a good friend of mine, but we actually just met, but I think that we might end up being friends because he seems like a very nice guy to me. Uh, This is David Robinson. He is the director of Bangkok River Partners. David, thank you for coming on the the show and welcome to the Bangkok podcast. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Now you and I have sort of, uh, we've never met, but uh, we've got probably about a dozen friends in common, I would imagine, and our social circles circles kind of overlap here and there. Right now, we're sitting in your office at uh, River Pla- River River City, yeah. um, down on the Chao Phraya River, which is one of my favorite areas of Bangkok. I used to live very close to here, and I still live very close to here, but not as close as I used to live. And um, I, I, I've, I've, I've seen your site, and I've heard of your uh, project for years, and I've always been a big fan of it. So it's great that I'm finally getting around to having you on the show, because it's a really interesting thing to follow. And it strikes at one of the core ideas that I've talked about on the podcast before, which is that for a city of Bangkok's size and vibrancy and life, 
the river to me has always struck me as being really bizarrely underdeveloped. And we're starting to see that change slowly now. And you are, are, you are the man in the middle uh, leading the charge to sort of promote the river and help uh, unite the businesses and communities and districts around the river to make it appeal more to a wider audience. So, I mean, that's a hell of an introduction, but tell us a little yeah. bit about your project and what you do. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I'm from Sydney. So I grew up on the harbour and then I moved to London and was close to the Thames and used to walk along the Thames a lot. Um, and when I lived in London, the Thames, you know, South Bank wasn't what it is now. You know, the development of South Bank uh, since the 1990s has, has come a long way. Okay. And when I came to Bangkok in 2002, it struck me that, as you say, the river was really underplayed. Yeah. It was, it was not uh, celebrated as it could. Of course, it's always been the River of Kings for Thai people, but... Uh, at some point, the centre of gravity had moved to Siam and, and Sukhumvit uh, and left the river uh, as Old Town. Right. Uh, and I was uh, had a conversation with the general manager of the peninsula in 2014 and then with the Amanda at the Mandarin Oriental, and they were starting to think about promoting it because they'd been through the flood and business had really suffered. And so they wanted to come together as a business group to promote the river area for mice, you know, for the meetings industry. And my advice was to actually, no, do it more comprehensively, promote it as a complete destination. So in uh, 2015, January 2015, I started on the project to promote the Chow Pra as a destination for leisure and tourism. Mm. That's great because it, it really is a unique uh, community, and I say community, but it's communities, and it runs from you know, south down to the other side of Banka Chow, kind of past the port and all the way up north to Cockret in, in mm. Nontabury. Um, so it's an incredibly diverse stretch of of land. But I think for our purposes, we're going to focus on sort of central Bangkok. And I'm looking at a map on the wall now. Um, our patrons will see a big photo of it that we'll include. But, um, you know, it goes from sort of down south by Asia Teak and across the Ramathri Bridge all the way up past uh, Sanam Luang, which is near the Grand Palace. And that's kind of the center of, of the river life as, as it applies to sort of yeah, I think modern Bangkok. The river going through Greater Bangkok is about 52 kilometers. Wow. So, um, yeah, to the north, you've got where the new parliament house is. Yeah. And then, as you say, Banka Chow and further on. So yeah. uh, it's an important tributary. Yeah. So tell me a bit about the community. Like, I, I love the river. I've always lived close to the river. Not always, but in my entire 20 years in Bangkok, I've most of the time lived near it. And it's just, it's just got this interesting little vibe, this different lifestyle that comes out of it. It's hard to explain, but what, what makes the river such a unique part of Bangkok? I think it's the neighbourhoods, the communities that live along the river. Uh, we have five of them detailed on the website, um, starting uh, north of Rotonacosan, south Rotonacosan, of course, Klong San and Kuti Jean. You know, Chinatown is on the river yeah. and, and Bangrak and Klong San, what we call the creative district. So there's a lot of history in there. You know, the Portuguese of Kuti Jean and uh, Little India and Chinatown and the trading going back. Of course, Bangrak was the trading hub yeah. for Thailand in the 1880s and beyond. So there's, I think it's, that's what makes Bangkok interesting. There's a lot of history there, but there are still people living there, carrying out their lives as they were. Right. And each community is slightly different. They're known for different things, like Talat Noi, where I used to live, is where the you know those giant piles of engines come. And, you know, like you said, Chinatown is Chinatown. And then Paharat is Little India, and it's got the old Siam and some of those crazy fabric markets. And then you go across the river to Kuti Jean, which is, I, th I think, the oldest church, Santa Cruz Church. Yeah. The Portuguese influence, and there's a Muslim community over there. Yeah. Like, it's just such a fantastic place. And I always tell people the best thing to do, what should I do in Bangkok that's not in the books? And I'm just like, get out of a taxi in this neighborhood and get lost. You know, walk around in these neighborhoods and, and eat everything, eat whatever you see and, and, and smile a lot, and you'll be surprised what happens. So what's, what was the reaction then when you started approaching these businesses and saying, let's do this together, let's band together and, and promote? That, because they were businesses, we had a sort of, I had a four point strategy, which was about creating a brand, you know, telling stories, building a digital universe. Um, but I realized in the first month that we needed that community. 
And when I looked around the community, around the hotels, there was a lot of things starting to happen in Bangrak. You know, you've got famous street food. You've got people that have been here for generations. Bangrak is sort of the area with Silo, Southern Silom, yeah, and Saton, and Saton, Jaringu. and you know, you had the Konji shop and the chicken shop that had been there for 120 years, and and Lek Gallery that has been here for trading for 40 years. So, and then there were new people as well. There was Peter and Stephanie at. Um, Tentacle. Yeah, there was Dungrit doing the jam factory, yeah. just been doing. And we invited people to, to a meeting under a tree at the jam factory. And we said, you know, if we're going to be a community and make this place more livable and more sustainable, you know, build an economy for local people, what would we do? And that was the genesis of the creative district. And, of course, since then, in the five, six years since then, you've seen a big change in the number of young Thai people wandering around, visiting new shops, new startups, new restaurants, 8020, Jua. Um, there's a brand new one, Caravana. There's Mother Roaster in Talat Noi. I mean, I think that's what was so interesting about um, about this area. It was all there. We just had to look at it and realise it. Yeah. And um, I was just commenting earlier. I mean, right now we're in River City on the third floor. And this is where, um, to great fanfare recently, um, the uh, the Van Gogh, Van Gogh, if I want to say it properly, uh, ex- exhibit is, as well as the Andy Warhol exhibit. And it's really busy down here, much busier than I've seen it in a long, long time. Um, the area itself, River City, like the, the, the facility, the building has been renovated and it's a beautiful space now. Uh, you showed me this really crazy little uh crystal crystal uh, walk crystal walk which is like this darkened hallway with these incredible what are they like crystals natural what, crystals like uh, 150 million years old yeah. like big you know those giant rocks, rocks that are cracked open with crystals inside gorgeous stuff um there's the art gallery here that is just opened so it's it's becoming hip dare i use that word uh, yeah, it's well, it's becoming contemporary. Okay. Well, you know, this centre has, for 35 years, it was built as an antique centre in homage to some of the antique centres in Paris. And it used to be four floors of antiques. Right. But markets change and the new next generation are looking for different things. So right. balancing that out has been important. Yeah, I was saying um, when I used to live here, I used to love coming to River City and walking around, but it was it was kind of crusty. It was antiques and nothing else and i love antiques but really not a lot of reason to come here unless you were into antiques but now there's way more stuff here so it's interesting to see the development and i think that's happening on both sides of the river up and down yeah yeah uh, a lot more when i walk around if i sometimes i'll take a journalist around or sometimes uh visitors will come with tour guides you know like smiling albino or abercrombie and kent and we'll take off for a walk um someone told me that you showed uh tim cook around here yes in fact, um, Tim, I brought Tim here uh, and he met Gong Khan, who's a very popular Thai artist now. Like Warhol, he's also a commercial artist. He went to New York and worked in advertising and he's found a real market and uh, uh, Tim is now one of his big collectors. Oh, jeez, nice. <laughs> I hope you got a commission for that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the uh, the famous maligned river walkway pathway thing that was on and then it was cancelled and then it was on and then it was cancelled um, I'm, I'm still not sure if it was a, a good idea, poorly planned or just a bad idea what, what do you think about that? Just just for some background in case our listeners don't know, they had planned to to, to um, build a promenade, promenade like uh, several kilometres long, uh, the 52 kilometres the entire, the entire oh length of the Chao Preya uh, on both sides above the river happened to be three car lanes wide on both sides that was uh, promoted as a, a a walkway and a cycleway. But, of course, being three car lanes wide, there were questions. Yeah, why do you – I mean, three bicycle lanes wide. All right, maybe that will be something different. But, mm. yeah. So, what, what – So, I mean, I think this is interesting because I understand that uh, transportation of some type has been planned for 25 years. I think the first uh, idea was to put it down the middle of the – uh, river. Uh, uh, so that wasn't so good. About five years back, uh, UDDC, which is the planning department of Chilalakon University, uh, Dr. Niramon, had done a study of the Yanawa project. And the Yanawa project was from Sapantaxan Bridge to the Chatrim Hotel, a 
kilometre and a half of community space, walkway and cycleway, including the temple and that sort of thing. I remember that, yeah. Uh, and that's a great project, and that was a lot of interest in uh, making community space and access. She also did a study of uh, uh, Klongsan, four kilometres of access. There's also been a study of Chinatown, another couple of kilometres of access. So I think pocket access is really good. because so it's it, doesn't, good for, it doesn't have to be like the entire length. Yeah, because you want people to be able to walk along the river, walk through a community, walk back along the river. It doesn't cut off business. You know, it, you know a lot of people need people walking through the, the district for vendors and that sort of thing. So I think um, having access to the river is a good thing. And when... The, the latest incarnation of this project, that when it was announced, there was a very quick group formed, uh, Friends of the River, uh, from different parts of society, and it managed to mobilise support very quickly. Uh, and to challenge this, we looked at three strategies, uh, and I think we were successful in one of those strategies. But, you know, one was trying to convince the people in power, another one was uh, trying to come up with legal argument and the third was a master plan, a long-term master plan for the river. And I think the long-term master plan is what's needed. Yeah. Uh, but we were successful through litigation and halting the project for some time. Okay. So there, there is a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I genuinely think, you know, having lived in London where you can walk along the Thames and being in Sydney where you've got pockets of Sydney Harbour giving access, I think it's really important for, for people living in this big metropolis um, but it has to be done sensitive, sensitively you know, right. with the environment, with access, uh, thinking about all the challenges that roadways on rivers make. And it seems to me that there's, there's been some talk, whenever there's talk about a new bridge or a new pathway or whatever, um, the communities that live, like the people that live in these communities along the river, a lot of them are, I'm not sure if squatting is the right word, but oh. they're slums basically. Yeah, a lot of as you as you go up the river, what's interesting about this river is you you see a lot of houses on stilts. Yeah. They're actually built over the water. The reason this structure was going to be over the water is because you don't need landowners' permission to do it. But you know, you're right next to their living room. Yeah. So they started removing houses. Yeah. Uh, and that was stopped, luckily, because that, that's part of the character. I mean, you you can't sanitize. Right. You know, I think Bangkok has this fantastic chaos. That exactly. makes it what it is. Controlled chaos, barely yeah, controlled chaos. I think Singapore would love that chaos. They'd like to make, manufacture <laughs> that sometimes. But, I mean, I think we, when we live in Bangkok, we know that we're living with the chaos and the harmony side by side. You know, you've got beautiful hotels and restaurants and hospital, uh, spa services and that sort of thing with, with, with all of the rest. Yeah. And it seems to me that a lot, whenever these communities are... Um, sort of considered to be in the way they're no one really cares they're just like oh we got to get these people out of here you saw it with the park down by the the fort down by ratanikos yeah. you know and now they put this park in there that no one goes to yes. because it's too hot outside and, <laughs> and it's not a not a huge park or anything but yeah it seems to me like i mean there's been pop-ups where they've wanted to remove street vendors and that sort of thing in the past and i think last time cnn came out very loud and said that's part of bangkok yeah I recently wrote a story for my buddy's blog, um, Living in Asia, about the new, the, I think it's called the Chow Praya Garden Walk, the, the bridge across oh, yes, uh, yeah, the, the Skywalk. The, the Skywalk, yeah, yeah, the old bridge across the, the, the river that was repurposed and turned into what they call a garden. And it's a great thing. It's a great project. In my story, I said I think they're playing a bit fast and loose with the phrase garden. Uh, it's, it's more like a bridge with a couple plants more, more plants and trees than normal. But it's... I said, that's not the point. The point is that it exists at all. Because so often in Bangkok, especially when you're dealing with a lot of the old architecture that is that is very common on the river, they just come in with a bulldozer, flatten it all, and then build a new building that looks old, but has none of the character. Yeah. So I think the idea that you can reclaim the stuff that's there and repurpose it, maybe you know, gut it and fix it up again, but don't destroy it. I think that was a really important step. And the river is rife for that. There's so much down there that can be gutted, renovated, and keep that character like they did with Long 1919, which is a fascinating, beautiful place. Mm -hmm. But, I mean... But there's other places as well. There's a, there's a fish sauce house 
uh, next to Princess Mother Memorial Park that had been operating for 90 years and the grandchildren have taken back the house because there's now a factory outside Bangkok and they've got a cafe in there. It's still as the house. It's still got the fish sauce in it, but it's it's authentic. You know, it's yeah. not it's not a Disneyland makeup. It actually was a fish sauce Good. factory. And I think that's what's really interesting. The other thing interesting, talk about the Sky Bridge that's interesting, there's a, an initiative called We Park. W-E-P-A-K. And this is about pocket parks and creating more green space on little passes of land. So, for example, uh, River City has planted trees in the area between Sheraton and River City, which is above the Klong, which is a public space. They've planted trees in there to create more green space. And I think these are the sort of things that you'll start to see in Bangkok, hopefully. Right. Right. Uh, the, the Sky Bridge is part of that, you know, more green space. In Bangkok, we have 3.62 square metres per person. Yeah, it's one of the lowest in, in the world, In Singapore, right? you've got about 30. So there is a Bangkok initiative to to build that back. I think their first target is 10, 10 square metres per person. Yeah, and I think everyone wants to see, uh, a, you know, a giant new park like reclaiming the old train depot at Makassan, you know. That's great. I hope it happens how realistic that is, I don't know. But it sounds like these micro parks that you were talking about is a much more feasible solution for Bangkok, how it exists today. Yeah, so, and, and, and communities can look after them. Yeah. I think that participation is really important. Uh, there's a new one going uh, next to the temple at uh, Samyan, and it's just been finished. It's small enough to create some green space, but it's close enough for the community to take pride in it. Yeah. And I think involvement of the community is really important. Cool. So let's talk about the the creative district then, the creative district product. It's sort of the rebranding of this area as the creative district. Uh, how did that start and where is it going and how is it doing? Yeah, well, uh, as I said, we started it in uh, our first meeting of about 40 people that were Thai and foreigners, journalists, art galleries, entrepreneurs, uh, under the tree at the jam factory was February 2015. Uh, and we just stood around and some of us had lived internationally and said, you know, if we are to make our area more livable, how would we do it? Uh, and what followed was a discussion and then said, people said, well, let's meet next month. And we continued meeting month after month. And, and after a time, people said, well, you've got to move this on. You know, we have to do something. How are we going to move it on? So we drew up a charter. Uh, and we invited the BMA and Crown Property and Tamasat University and the heads of the religious communities and people living in the area, and we had about 12 town hall meetings. And what came out of that was this creative district. And around the same time, you know, because it was a convergence of like-minded people, Dungut had done the jam factory. Shortly after we started doing this, TCDC, the Thailand Craven Design Centre, announced they were moving from Emporium to the Grand Postal Building. The big old Soviet-looking uh, building yeah, on Jaron Kroon Road. Yeah, it's a great space. Mussolini Italian architect. And, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so we were lucky being in the right place at the right time. It was the right time for, uh, for Bangkok. Uh, it was old Bangkok, a lot of Italian architecture, uh, a mix of luxury hotels and and small eateries like Harmonique that you know, sit under a tree and eat with yeah. the, the three sisters. So this great mix of new and old but authentic. Uh, and, and that's really resonated with people of interest. It, of course, the international market loves it. That's what they come to Bangkok for, to see Chinatown and Talat Noi and Bang Rak. Um, but also what's encouraging is that particularly now in our COVID era, we're seeing so many more people, Thai people, come and explore, set up business. People that have been here for generations like Mook, who is at 19, you know, her father is Lek, one of the big traders here, or new people setting up uh, little cafes and that sort of thing, wanting their, their future to be here. Yeah. So it's that mix. Yeah, and it's uh, this is something we've talked about on the show before is that um, you know, I, when I was just talking earlier about how today it's very crowded here and I see a lot of young people down here, which is great. Mm. And I think now you're seeing, like you also mentioned, a lot of these young people taking over their families' uh, old spaces and yeah. stuff. But these young people have been educated overseas and they've traveled overseas and they're coming back and they, they realize, hey, we're sitting on a gold mine here and nothing's being done about it. So it's, I, I think, I hope, and maybe you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, that the the average that's the way the thinking process is moving for the average young Thai person now. Yeah, I, th I think you have to be on guard. Uh, uh, 
no one wants gentrification. Uh, so part of our charter was, okay, how do we address rent protection? You know, how do we have discussions with landlords so that people aren't forced out? Rents don't go skyrocket. How do we how do we green the space so it's more environmentally enjoyable, more trees, less plastic, you know that sort of thing. How do we help business? You know the high speed internet in the country. Luckily, we've got CAT here. So you know there's a, a range of things that we need to try and work on. You know how do we get tax incentives for creative industry? Um, you know you set up a business here, you pay less tax. These are big discussions in the Thai context. Yes. Uh, not happening fast, but uh, I think as far as protecting the built environment, protecting buildings, what we needed to do when we when we did a study, we found that 19% of the buildings in this area were vacant. 19%. Yeah, so that's a concern because a vacant building has no value or no revenue. So our our one of our drivers was to fill that vacant space because if we could prove it had a commercial value as it was, then it's less likely to be torn down. I think the jam factory is a good example of that. Warehouse 30 at 19. Uh, I met the architect for the old customs house who's just started work on the, the new hotel there. So I think ensuring that people can see a return on a current structure is really important for protecting that built environment. Interesting. The gentrification issue is one that's interesting because my wife and I, we bought our condo just down on, on, in, in Tonbury. You know, and we see things like Icon Siam. I mean, complain all you want about another mall, but it's nice having that close to your place, having a movie theater and a place to take your kid and all these restaurants and the Apple store and what have you, you know, if you want to be a bit of a hipster. Um, but it, it is a shame to see that at the expense of these little little places, these cool, charming little family establishments that have been there for decades and decades. So... Um, but I, but they're, co- they're coexisting at the they moment. They can coexist. Which is but, great to see. You know, for how long? And I, I, I get the call of the almighty dollar, the almighty bot. Like, you know, you saw it with a Scala theater. That land is just too valuable to be selling tickets at 100 baht a pop. So I get it. I get the financial reasoning behind it. But it seems to me like it's going to be an ongoing battle ad infinitum. Yes, but I, I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing. And, you know, there's a family here that have been trading in antiques for a long time. They've been in this city, in this centre for 35 years. They have an old house in Talat Noi. They're investing a lot to develop it, to open it up for people to visit. That's great. So I, I do think we're seeing a change. You know, seeing people in River City come to these exhibitions, uh, seeing Gong Khan sell all his work to Thai, young Thai people, uh, artists selling, buying markets, that sort of thing. I think I think we're seeing a change and I'm just hoping that we can have them all that is, as you say, very practical for so many reasons, you know, gyms and cinemas and food halls and shops all in one place, but they can coexist with an area around it that uh, is old buildings and that sort of thing. Encouraging news to hear. So as we're wrapping up then, um, I mean, where where can people find out more? And most importantly, how can they contribute to the success of the Creative District and the River Project? Uh, well, we have a couple of websites. So we've got BangkokRiver.com, uh, which talks about the neighbourhoods and the venues and the historic places and the people living in this area. Uh, we've got Creative District Bangkok.com, which is less developed but talks about the different communities. Um, but I think the best way to support the place is to come down and visit. Yeah. I mean, that's – and and you'll really be surprised at what's here uh, and the little shops and the different uh, artisans and craftspeople and the old vendors and, you know, buying curry puffs on the street and that sort of thing is – it's got a unique character. Totally, totally. And it's even easier than ever now that the, the subway goes down to Ratanako Sin – uh, so it's easier than ever to get down here. Yeah. And like I said, get out of the taxi, get off the train and start walking. And yeah. You'll, you'll be amazed it's what you very, discover. It's really interesting because when you walk in the narrow soys of Talat Noi, they all run from the river. So there's a breeze that comes through the shaded soys. It's not that hot really. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I ride my bike uh, through and around um, this area all the time. And it's just, it's incredible what you find. So yeah. It's a great area to explore. Well, David, thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, it's great to hear that things are changing and that that that, that people are thinking um, positively about you know sustainability of the of the character of the area into the future. So 
Great we to hope talk to see to great things. And um, yeah, everyone, come down here. Join us for a coffee. Join us for a croissant or a puff. And uh, check out the area. So, David, thanks again. Thank you. Well, you and I have talked a lot about developing the river, but our focus was more on um, kind of the government taking charge of the river area. And this is more about encouraging private businesses, which is good. I mean, this is really more about economic development. Yeah, right. And it's really cool that he got so much interest and buy-in from a a lot of sort of like uh, community leaders and industry leaders in Bangkok who really want to retain, you know, help help promote the river as as a destination within Bangkok. Because it really is. We've talked on the show before about just how awesome it is, the communities down there and exploring and the, the great food and old buildings and stuff that, uh, that go all the way up and down the river on both sides because there's there's still a ton of stuff there. And like me and David talked about, it's got, you know, for a city the size of Bangkok, the river is really, really strangely underdeveloped, which means it's a great opportunity for people to get out and explore. For sure. Underutilized. I think we, we talked about it almost two years ago on the show it's like it's something i've never figured out about bangkok is uh that there's so much cool stuff on the river but i feel like in general it's uh, it, it's kind of almost like the river is ignored by most people it's just yeah. you know it's, it, it's 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 a little bit it's it's just odd it doesn't make sense yeah you know yeah the river in bangkok is kind of like that really weird friend that you have like <laughs> that no one else really likes but you're like no you just got to spend some time once you get to know him he's really cool the river's like that like you got to put some effort into it but it's a really yeah, yeah, rewarding yeah. thing to, to, to learn about yeah so. well the government needs to be proactive but it's kind of cool that this organization is uh doing their thing and 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 the businesses themselves are organizing maybe they can use the slogan that i just made the chow Praya river your weird friend that that <laughs> That might work. Emphasis emphasis on the might. <laughs> well, many thanks to David for coming on the show and, and sitting down and talking to me. Um, check out the, the website, BangkokRiver.com. There's a ton of really good resources there. It's a beautifully designed website. I love their logo too, which you can see on our artwork, our episode artwork. But um, yeah, he's a good guy. He knows all about all about what's going on. So uh, head, there, head to his website to learn more about yourself and get to know it. Get to know your weird friend. <laughs> Always a good idea. All right, let's get into some love, loathe, or live with, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or if come to accept is just something we have to learn to live with no matter how we feel about it. And this week it is my turn. So Ed, you, uh, you're you with your wife or Thai relative or something like that, and they want to stop by the temple, and you go to stop by the temple, and you, you're, you're in the mood to sort of partake in the Thai cultural element of the thing, and you go to the monk and you kneel down and get some water splashed on your head. And then he asks to tie a little string around your wrist. Ah, yes. The white, usually the white string, white correct? piece of string. Usually, you know, the Westerners would probably be for, more familiar with wrapping up parcels before you drop them off for the post office. But here it's a legitimate spiritual, uh, token, spiritual token, That's spiritual good. token. Yeah. What do you think about this, this thing? And let, let me be clear, not, not, not the, the act of doing it, like the, what it represents, that's not it. I mean, actually walking around for several days or, or longer with this piece of string tied around your wrist. Right. You know, I, I was going to say that I remember when I first saw this, but I, to be honest, I can't remember specifically the first time I saw this, but uh, it was definitely in the first year I was here where I kind of noticed the, the white string thing. Right. You know, and I think I can't remember if I saw it on people's wrists first or if I was actually at some kind of temple, but it took me a while to figure out, oh, the string, it's, it, it's, it's not just random string. It's not, it's not some fashion statement. It's, it's got some <laughs> spiritual significance or it's part of Thai, you know, Thai Buddhist culture. Uh, yeah, you know, it's what it is, what it is, you know, so it's, it's kind of thing. I think it's uh, to me, it would be the kind of thing that would be hard to hate, but also like, I'm not sure why it would be something you would love because it's not like some kind of interesting bracelet. It's not some cool, like Sanskrit, like logo on your wrist. It's just string. It's just white <laughs> string. You know what I mean? Right. Right. The, the, but that, that's, that's why I'm going to go, I'm going to come down with this on love. I love this. That's why I love it is because it's just oh, this, okay. this, this very ordinary banal thing that you don't even think twice about, but it's been turned into sort of this representation of something much greater. Yeah, so I believe like that white string plays a role in Thai traditional wedding ceremonies. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it's supposed to mean, but 
it's it's definitely uh, a part of Thai traditional culture. You know, it's it, it shows up in different places at temples, at weddings. Yeah, um, I remember from my wedding. I mean, we didn't. No one tied a uh, string around our wrists, but we did have each of us wore like a little uh, flower crown, and there was a string going between my wife's and mine. Um, yeah, and I took a picture of that to use against you later. Right. Yeah, I remember you. All I've got a picture of you drunk dancing at my wedding that I can use against you. So <laughs> okay, <there> shit. <laughs> all right. Well, let's just let's forget about this then. But uh, I think it's cool, and of course, I think I think the the men's goes on the right hand, and the women's goes on the left hand. Maybe backwards, but um, I, I like it. I think it's 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 a simple thing, but it means a lot, and I think it's sort of a, a, a symbol that the person who's wearing it probably has a, an above average level of insight into Thai culture. Ah, okay. That's how I, I think like that. It. I'll go for that. I'll go for that. I'll take that. Right. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go live with. But I get your point. All right. Cool. Cool. So, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'd like to say thank you to Jonathan Gadir for lending us his support at the show shoutout level. Greg, what did you find out about Jonathan? Well, as it turns out, our buddy Jonathan is from Sydney, Australia, and I've actually met him. Him and I had lunch about a year ago, and he was in cool. town. I think cool. his dad actually lives in Thailand. He was he was visiting his dad, but uh, he he's like I said, he's from Stryden, Sydney. He's an Aussie, and uh, he said he used to be a journalist, but his latest project is combining my two areas of expertise and hoping to become the go to guy for legal advice on anything related to social media. Cool, and that got me thinking, Ed. Like you know how I always try to uh, you know I was going to say the word use, but I prefer the, the term uh, borrow our listeners' Ah. skills for our own dastardly ends. I see. But uh, I'm thinking that maybe Jonathan would be a nice guy, and maybe he'll, uh, since he's going to be a social media lawyer, you and I can get fast and loose on the podcast. We can talk about whatever we want. We can swear. We can say bad things. We can Heck yeah, I'm all for that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we can just, you know, if someone calls us and says, hey, you can't do this to me. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to see you in court. We'll just call our buddy Jonathan. Beep, boop, beep, boop, beep. No problem. Heck yeah. Yeah, we got a guy on retainer. Uh, I haven't I haven't passed this idea by him yet, but he seems like a pretty nice guy when I met him, so I'm sure he'd be up for it. All righty, man. Works for me. <laughs> That's right. And uh, Jonathan said he's written a book about his experiences in Japan, which nobody bought, but it looks great on my CV, and I'm juggling my attempts to learn both Thai and Korean. I'm wow. not sure which of these languages I'll master first. I'm going to say Korean because I've heard that's an easy language to learn how to read and write. Are you insane? Dude, Korean's like up there man it's one of the hardest are you insane what no i've heard no i'm serious i i've 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 known many people no. who've lived in korea and have learned it within a few years fluently no the, the, the hangul alphabet was created oh. by a king specifically so the commoners could learn it and use it very okay easily. okay okay maybe okay maybe the alphabet but i, I don't think the language is easy no, I, don't I, don't, I don't think so i think i think japanese korean and thai like they're they're, they're not easy for yeah. different reasons but yeah yeah well but maybe the alphabet, maybe the Korean alphabet is easy. That could be true. Well, I guess the only way to solve this is, Jonathan, you need to come to back to Thailand when things open up. We've got to have lunch lunch again. We Heck can, yeah. We can present you with a stack of our lawsuits that are going to come our way, and you can <laughs> you can uh, tell us which is harder, Thai or Korean. I'm going to say Thai. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. <laughs> All right. We but shall see. Thanks for your support, man. Uh, it's, it was really appreciated, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Yes. Thank you, Jonathan. A final thanks to our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website and connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. True that. You can also hit up each episode on YouTube. You can chat with us online. Or even reach out to me directly on Twitter, where I'm BKK Greg, if that's your thing. So thank you for listening, everyone. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you back here next week. Definitely. I had, a, I had the idea for a podcast about 22 years ago because I've got a friend, <laughs> my friend in Canada, Alec, is is one of my oldest and best friends. And we have this incredible rapport when we talk, it's just this like, you know, like joke, joke, cool. joke. And I thought like, we should do like, we should record our, we should record our conversations and like play them on the radio or something, which was <laughs> basically a podcast, but this was in like 
1999. Right. What I'm saying, Ed, is that I'm way ahead of my time. You could have been Joe Rogan, but you're not. Well, I'm bald, so. <laughs> That's right. You got that going for you. My son today, when we were morning, he was in the morning on the way to school. He was going, Hualan, Hualan, which means oh, really? bald head, bald head. You know, and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. But then we had to remind him, like, you know, don't say that to people. <laughs> we say it to daddy. <laughs> He's like, why? I'm like, well, some people don't like being told that they're bald. <laughs> bald. Look at your bald head. Yeah, look at your baldy. Cue ball. Mr. Cue ball. <laughs> I can tell him the story. Isn't there a Bible story about some kids were called a guy bald and then he, like, God made a bear eat them or something? Is that right? Sounds like God, it. Sounds like your Bible knowledge is better than mine. Well, I did grow up in that realm. <laughs> 